Welcome to the Keeping the Nostalgia Live show. I am your host, Billy Powell. You are probably listening to this on Keeping the Nostalgia Live. That's all one word, Keeping the Nostalgia Live dot podbean dot com. And or you are watching and listening to this on our YouTube channel, which is Keeping the Nostalgia Live show. Just go to YouTube and type in Keeping the Nostalgia Live show on both of those um, uh, platforms. You can uh, hear and see interviews of um, just so many that uh, have been associated with the great state of Indiana, with baseball, with basketball. I've got a couple of uh, entertainment interviews on there. And um, just, you know, I love keeping the nostalgia alive. And uh, please go with this is our 226 episode. And uh, with all of that being said, uh, let me introduce our guest today, which is Glenn Rosenbaum. He has he spent four decades as a member of the Chicago White Sox organization. Uh, he's from Union Mills, Indiana, so I got my six degrees of separation in there. Um, and the neat thing about our guest um, is that um, he played at beautiful Bush Stadium, which um, from 74 up to 87, 88, me and my grandfather had so many great times there. Grandfather has since passed, but... I just, man, I just, so many great memories at uh, Bush Stadium, and uh, it'll be interesting to hear um, uh, Glenn's recollection of beautiful Bush Stadium on 16th Street. So, uh, Glenn, thank you so much for joining us and uh, uh, taking some time out of your day to help keep the nostalgia alive. All right. Glad to do it. Uh, Glenn, was was the first sport that you played in Union Mills, Indiana, was it was baseball your first sport that you were introduced to? Well, yeah, we were in a small school like I went to in LaPorte County. You, uh, The baseball season was in the fall, and then it went into basketball and then track. So we, we did everything. But my brother and I were raised on a farm, and we, we constantly, when we weren't working, we had the, our ball gloves on. So baseball was always my first love. You know, as as time progresses, the 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 idea of the American farmer and the American farm is is going to fade away. I'm glad that probably won't be in my lifetime, but that that's that's, that's going to be a shame. Yeah, the uh, the small farmer, like we were, we were the typical farm. We we had uh, two hundred ten acres, and then we farmed a neighbor farm, which put us around three hundred acres, and that was just. You know, average in those days, and we had milk cows, and you had uh, pigs, you had chickens. It was, you know, the typical farm in those days, and you don't see that many, many places anymore. Was your were, were your mother and father athletic? And tell us about your siblings a little bit. Well, my dad was a good athlete, and he played basketball and baseball. And then my brother was four years older than I was, and uh, so uh, as soon as my mom said as soon as I was old enough to to walk, I was throwing a ball around the house. So <laughs> I have to take her word for that. But, uh, yeah, we were always uh, involved, and my brother was a talented athlete. He was left-handed, and he was a great basketball player and a baseball player and he pitched for Purdue and was the most valuable player there in 54 so uh, and then I came along after he did into high school and uh, we didn't have little league in those days so my first organized baseball game I ever played in was when I went into high school and 
pitched my first game on the varsity as a freshman. So it's just the way it was then. Without the little league, you know, you just you learned in the in the uh, in the yard in the uh, barnyard with my brother and I. We threw every day, and with him being a pitcher, uh, Dad bought me a catcher's mitt. So I he threw to me every day after after chores and stuff like that. And, you know, when I got old enough, well, then he'd catch me. And so it was uh, it was constant baseball when we weren't working. You know, when I was in high school, I'm originally from Indianapolis, Indiana. I went to Broad Ripple High School. When I was in high school, I went to some yard sales with my mother and my grandmother. And you, you talk about, your family bought you a catcher's man. I bet you it wasn't one of those fang dangled uh, Johnny Bench models or Ted Simmons models. It was probably one I found at one of my uh, garage sale finds. And you know, you had to, you had to be, you had to have some skill to be able to use an old time catcher mitt, didn't you? Yeah, and you know, it was comical. The first, the first uh, catcher's mitt my dad bought for me uh, was. Uh, you know, it wasn't really leather. <laughs> you know, not a not a quality leather, and and uh, every time I'd catch a pitch, a little bit of puff of dust would come out of it. And I uh, finally complained enough that uh, my hand was hurting. So one day when he went to Laporte, he came home with a brand new Walker Cooper model. You know, and that was before the hinge model, and it was the old fashioned catcher's mitt and uh but uh that was great then because i could uh, catch my brother and didn't have to have my hand being punished every day <laughs> <laughs> you know we're all a part of uh uh I, 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 I we're all a part of our ge- geography of where we're born and raised you know like uh, me telling you on the outset that i'm from indianapolis and uh you know so so Going to Indians games, and of course, at that point in time, growing up, the Indians were the AAA farm club of the Reds. So I was a Reds fan. I'm assuming um, I may be incorrect that you were you always a were you, were you a White Sox at the get fan at the beginning, or a Cubs fan, or uh, did you follow a different baseball team as a youngster? I grew up. I grew up as a Cubs fan when I was, you know, when I was uh, a little guy that I didn't have to. Uh, work in the field yet. I was uh, in the living room one day, and we had the old-fashioned Philco radio, and I was messing with that, and all of a sudden I found a ball game. So I listened to it, and it was uh, Burt Wilson broadcasting the Cubs. So when the game was over, and then they had what they called the 10th inning, an interview after the game, they said, same time, same station tomorrow, so I got a pad of uh, paper and uh, I wrote down the, the number of the station and the time, and uh, so that's how I became a Cup fan. And and uh, my brother and I and and Dad, we followed the Cubs all those years until I signed with the White Sox. You know, um, at Marsh Supermarkets in Indianapolis, there they you had a they had a sp- uh, promotion going on where um, it was old time radio shows, and uh, each week uh, out there they'd have a cassette of one of the old time radio shows like shows like uh, Who's on First with Abbott and Costello, and they had a uh, a baseball one with you know you know Mel Allen, you know, and uh, right. you know it's this is why I really love doing this because I really got into listening to some of those uh, you know Loman Abner Fred Allen the Jack Benny show uh, uh, you know and and some of those to and I, I feel like and I know I'm not but I feel like sometimes I I could just see you guys with your hands up underneath your chin you know wiggling your feet uh, listening to a baseball game or a radio show oh yes that uh, well we didn't get a TV till I was uh senior going into a senior in high school so the radio was our life you know we we listened dad listened to that for this for the market prices and uh, and we uh, it was our entertainment at light at night so the uh i uh 
I just was lucky to get that baseball game that day. So that's that's how we became Cup fans and everything. So it's uh, you know it's whatever you whatever you uh, hear first is what you cling to, and uh, so I was always a Cup fan. So. That's awesome. So tell us about the state of uh, what what was Indiana high school basketball like and how good were you as a basketball player? Well, I was on the varsity all four years, but I was just an average basketball player. I uh, I didn't have a lot. You know, I was only wasn't quite 5'11", so uh, our coach, we I had the fast break style of basketball and I was I was quick and fast so I uh, I I was hard to deal with on the fast break and and got fouled a lot and shot a lot of free throws but uh, uh, I I played basketball uh, in our little school you know you, you participated in everything so uh, basketball uh, when our coach first started uh, in those days you had one coach that coached from fifth grade on through the 12th you know and uh, so I can remember when I first started playing basketball in the fifth grade he had to show me where to stand and and uh, so that's that's how that all started because I you know without television being exposed to that kind of stuff you didn't you had no clue of what you were supposed to do, so that's how my basketball started. And uh, but uh, yeah, I enjoyed playing basketball, but not as much as baseball. Did you during you know as your baseball career progressed, and then of course your time in the White Sox organization? Did you did you follow Indiana high school bas- basketball or any basketball from the state of Indiana, or you know after you after you left and you started to focus on baseball? You know it was all about baseball. Well, it was all about baseball, but in the winter, yeah, I uh, I more or less uh, my brother went to Purdue, so we. Uh, we're interested in uh, Purdue football and basketball and things like that, and uh, so. Uh, but uh, the uh, in uh, in high school, I remember uh, standing in the kitchen, and we had a uh, radio on top of our refrigerator, and uh, listened to the Milan championship game. Yeah, and I'll never forget that. I stood there and listened to that ball game you know, about three feet from the radio. I just couldn't believe what was happening. So that was a big deal. Uh, at, at then what was called Butler Fieldhouse and became Hinkle Fieldhouse when uh, I was in high school at Broderpool. Uh, what a uh, what a p- fantastic venue and what a um, uh, a a year with the Milan Indians that uh, you know just of course movie Hoosiers came from that also but uh, amazing amazing uh, um, of goodies of that of that era. Oh yeah, because uh, you know a lot of people don't realize that Milan almost won it the year before. They were a terrific basketball team, and and, uh, and uh, here, uh, oh, I would say four or five years ago, in Laporte County, they took uh, two teams uh, from up north here and played in that gym where Hoosiers was filmed, and our high school got to go down there and play. So of course, I went down and, and got to watch a ball game in that gym and it was that was really really a nice experience seeing that gym that you'd seen in the movie uh yeah the hoosier gym in knightstown indiana that's fantastic you're right that's uh, uh it looks it looks just like it did in the movie that's for sure uh it does i went last i was there last august and uh it just you know it's you know, some people don't get the same kind of, uh, uh, you know, memories or, you know, uh, a smile to your face or, you know, that some others do, you know, and it's just, uh, it, it, it looks just like it was in the movie. It, it, it's an outstanding gym and I'm glad they've, uh, 
uh, kept it uh, preserved and continue to have it open for tours and stuff like that in Knightstown. It's pretty cool. Oh, yeah. that's. Uh, I really enjoyed seeing it. And, uh, you know, the, the movie Hoosiers was just such a favorite of mine because it was just practically like what I, the way I was raised in, uh, you know, the little school that I went to. So that, uh, that was a special movie. And then getting to see that gym was a was a special treat. So when did Major League Baseball scouts, you know, knock down your door for your multi-million dollar signing bonuses and contracts as a kid? <laughs> <laughs> well, going to a little school like I did in LaPorte County, we had, we had a good baseball team. We had a good program. Uh, when my brother, like I said, was four years ahead of me, and then when he left, I stepped in and, and we won the county championship all four years that I was in high school. And the uh, the uh, my senior senior year, I pitched a no hitter in the championship game. And there were two two fellows from uh, Laporte that played uh, in the Sunday League. Uh, they call it a Northern Indiana Summer Pro League, and uh, they were at the ball game, and on the following Monday, they came to to uh, Union Mills High School and talked to the principal, and they told them they wanted to talk to me. So it, on my lunch hour, they uh, talked to me and wanted to know if I, were, if I would play for them during the summer there in the port, and uh, I said, well, sure, that'd be fine with me. So I... Uh, after I graduated, I pitched two games, and after the second game, the umpire called me aside, and he says, have you ever considered playing professional ball? And I said, no, not really. I didn't think that was possible, you know. <laughs> and I never dreamed that big, you know, being from the area where I was. And he said, well, I know a White Sox bug scout, Bird Dog Scout, do you care if I have him come watch you play? And I said, no, I'd be fine. So the next Sunday, we were playing in Elkhart, and I pitched a good game against Elkhart Legion, and he came to the bench and gave me his card and told me to be in Comiskey Park on Tuesday night for a tryout. And uh, so that's how I got into professional baseball. That was probably your best interaction with the umpire in your entire life, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, I, I uh, you know, it was strictly an accident because being from a rural area, I farming was going to be in my future, and and so he he pretty much changed the course of my life. And what did mom and dad think of this? What uh, how the decision process go? Um, tell us a little bit about those details. Well, it was, you know, it was like something out of the blue. Uh, I came home from that game, and, and Mom and Dad and I stood there in the, out in the yard, and uh, I showed them the card the, from the scout, and, uh, and we talked about it for a little bit, and then, uh, well, how are we going to get to Comiskey Park? Because we... We there was no toll road or Dan Ryan or anything in those days, and and uh, we didn't know how to get there. And, and uh, my cousin was a big White Sox fan, and he had been there. He knew, so I got him and, and a high school buddy, and they took me up to Comiskey Park on Tuesday night. And I worked out. I threw on the side to uh, uh, Johnny Boston, who was the head scout, uh, Midwest supervisor, and he took over. And uh, I, I, all I remember is there was uh, probably the White Sox manager and, and some coaches, and uh, they had me throw on the side and when to see my breaking ball and when to you know, gave me targets, wanted to see what kind of control I had and everything. 
And then I threw a little batting practice to the uh, extra extra men. And then uh, during the ball game, uh, Johnny Moss was sat. We stayed for the game, and he sat in the stands and talked to me about minor league baseball. And uh, all I can remember is we left, and I got home about 1 o'clock in the morning. And the uh, next day, uh, you know, got up at quarter to 5 and did the milking. And uh, after breakfast and the chores, then I was out in the, in the field cultivating corn. And uh, I saw Dad's pickup coming down the lane and wondered what he was coming down for. And when they pulled into the field here, Johnny Mossel got out of the truck. And, and when I got to the end, he came over to the tractor, and we talked a minute. So I got off the tractor, and we got in the pickup and went back up to the house, and we sat around the kitchen table. And uh, he started talking, and... and uh, so it was it was quite an experience. Do you remember the time the team the White Sox were playing while you were there uh, um, the first time? Yeah, it was Washington Senators. Yeah, Irv Norton, I didn't know uh, the big right uh, left hand hit first baseman. That's all I remember. Of Washington. And uh, but anyway, he he talked with me about. Uh, uh, you know, the thing was, you know, it was in the spring of farming, and uh, he offered me a, a, a contract, an A, in, in Class A ball at Colorado Springs at uh, $600 a month. And, uh, and uh, he he could see, you know, Dad and I looking at each other and, we didn't really know what, and uh, I said, well, what, uh, you know, this is just the start of the farming season, and and Dad's going to be here by himself if I take off and leave. What what if I start next summer? And so then he proceeded to tell me what would take place, and well, then you'd have to start at the bottom and hit Dubuque, Iowa, and... Uh, so we we said, well, we're going to have to think about this. So he left, and <clears throat> and then on Saturday afternoon, when we were in the barn milking, he came and uh, stood in the barn while we were milking, and he came in and he ate supper with us. And then after supper, we sat at the kitchen table and and talked, and uh, finally I. I decided, uh, Dad said, well, it was all up to me. Uh, but I felt sorry for my dad, you know, being by himself, you know, uh, when he had had help with my brother and me for eight straight years and, you know, like a hired man, that he was going to be left alone. So I decided to finish out the summer at home and then start the next spring, so... That's what I did, and uh, it uh, it turned out to be smart because if I had gone to Colorado Springs right away out of high school uh, in that light air out there, I was a breaking ball pitcher, and uh, I probably would have got my ears pinned back, you know, getting out there and uh, uh, not being able to throw a good breaking ball and I probably would have gotten roughed up and may have been out of baseball in a year. So instead I went to Dubuque and got off to a great start and did one sixteen ball games and lost three that year, so it was it was a smart decision. And then on to Waterloo the next year with uh, almost about the same statistics. Yes. Yep. And then after that then I went to Colorado Springs and I and uh, and I was I was glad that I started you know, because I never would have survived out there because I had to uh, find a way to uh, to adjust to make my breaking ball break out there because uh, of the light air and 
a short bus stride, you know, and and uh, which sped up my arm and got more, you know, a better spin rate on the ball. And so uh, it was uh, Colorado Springs was not a good place for pitchers. <laughs> it was uh, it's a, definitely a hitter's league. What were your what were what were your times like when you pitched in Indianapolis? I'm assuming Indian. I'm assuming, and, and, and don't 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 take this the wrong way, but I'm assuming Indianapolis was the big city to uh, uh, you guys from Union Mills, and you know uh, what you know. And I know Chicago was much bigger, but you know, and I just disrespected Chicago didn't I, by saying that about Indianapolis. Um, what was it like coming to Indianapolis, playing at Bush Stadium? Your your uh, you know, you know. Tell me about your your, your stays in Indianapolis, and what you know. I know I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit, but. Um, uh, you know, your stories about Indianapolis and the Indianapolis Indians and Bush Stadium. Okay, well, I'd been at San Diego the year before, so I, you know, the, 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 the city was not that big of a thing to me, but uh, Bush Stadium was, uh, you know, the stands weren't that good, but the ball field itself was, was immaculate. I think the the groundkeeper name was Don Funkhauser, and uh, he uh, he had the best mound I've ever pitched off of. He was just what a groundkeeper he was. He just that field was immaculate, and uh, so I have nothing but good memories of Indianapolis. And I had a good year there, you know. And we we won the pennant, and I was playing for Luke Appling, which was was uh, an experience because he was a great guy and a, a heck of a, he was a car, you know, he was a un, uh, unorthodox guy. He didn't, he, uh, he, he danced to his own tune and he ran the ball club to, and he hated to lose. And uh, so it, it made for a great, it made for a great summer. And uh, no, my experience in Indianapolis was great. I loved it. What was it like playing uh, professional baseball? And did you have to, did, you know, you're, you're traveling a little bit of everywhere. You know, you have the opportunity to do this. You have the opportunity to do that because of how young you are. Was it your upbringing from mom and dad on uh, the choices that you made on, you know, do I go out with the guys? Do I stay at the motel wherever we're staying at? Stuff like that. Definitely so, yeah. Yeah, we, uh, mom and dad were a good base, plus I had a, uh, a, a real good high school coach that uh, taught taught discipline, and uh, uh, that was the main thing. When I when I left and played pro ball, I, I hadn't been exposed to much of anything, you know, uh, being raised in a rural area, and uh your life revolved around uh, uh, the farm, and as a, as a farm family, you were a, you were a unit, and you did everything together. And your aunts and uncles, you know, uh, that were close, and your cousins. That was your your life, really. So I wasn't exposed to much outside of uh, the farm and work and and. Uh, Playing sports, you know, when we had time. So uh, it was a it was a real learning experience when I left and uh, went to Dubuque that first summer because, you know, I had, I didn't have a clue about the real world really. I uh, I had to learn a lot of things real fast. I wasn't street street smart, so to speak, and uh, and. Uh, I had guys wanting me to go golfing with them, and I, you know, I'd never been exposed to that, so I said, no, what do you want? To, I don't want to go golfing. Guys wanted to go swimming. Well, I didn't know how to swim. I wasn't ever around water. You know, it was just things like that, and uh, it took me three, four years before I started to uh, uh, let myself go and experience some things, and... Uh, so it was uh, it was a learning experience for sure, but I always had uh, good roommates, and uh, so 
it was a good experience. I loved every second of it. You, you know, the the I wasn't a very good athlete, which I find that in what I do now was probably best because when I would sit on the bench, I would take everything in like a sponge. And the athletic director at Broderbill High School was Gene Ring, Eugene Ring, uh, a member of the Indiana Basketball Hall of Fame, um, uh, a, a member of the Indiana University Athletics Hall of Fame. Uh, he played for Branch McCracken, played for, um, in high school, played for uh, John Wooden. And uh, he ended up being the basketball coach at Broderbill High School and the athletic director. So I learned so much from him. And he played minor league baseball. And he would tell me of, uh, you know, the travel stories. I mean, what was it like to travel in the minor leagues? And did you, did you, did you, did you take it all in? Or did you kind of just, well, let's get to the next place and play the next game? No, I was, uh, the first year uh, at Dubuque, of course, you write about everything that's buses. And they weren't the best buses. <laughs> But I'll never forget, we went, one of the first road trips was uh, to Hannibal, Missouri. And uh, I was very curious about uh, Mark Twain and all these different things in, uh, you know, the historic part of Hannibal. So I got up one morning, uh, the second day we were in town, and and I took off walking. I got a map at the uh, Chamber of Commerce, and... I went to uh, Mark Twain's house, and uh, then I walked up to Lover's Leap, and I went to all the historical parts and, uh, you know, made a, a full day of it. And uh, we rode to the ballpark that night, and uh, in the first inning, our starting pitcher gets, gives up uh, four runs, and uh, he had... Uh, one out, and here I come in the ball game in relief. And uh, I'd been out walking around the town all day, and I pitched the rest of the ball game, eight and two thirds innings, and we came from behind and won. So that was my first day in Hannibal. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, yeah, I, I, I tried to. Uh, soak up the stuff when we of course the, the towns most of the towns you know what Mattoon, Illinois and Paris, Illinois and Lafayette, Indiana and Kokomo uh, things like that you know that uh, you didn't uh, you stayed in the hotel and uh, and if you got rained out uh, you'd go to the pool hall I'd been in that that was my first exposure at playing pool, just to kill time, you know. And I think you could play quarter game for pool in, that day, in those days, so it was cheap entertainment. So the traveling was not glorious in, in the minor leagues by bus. And uh, then when I got to the Pacific Coast League in AAA, then we flew. So... We flew up and you know up the coast. That was before Major League Baseball was out there, and went to Seattle and Vancouver, and Hawaii, and that was that was a, that was a great experience for me. That was saw things that I'd never dreamed I'd ever see. You know, you you won. Almost 68, 69% of your games in um, in the minor leagues, you know, and what, um, you know, there's expanded rosters now and all that kind of stuff. Uh, how disappointed were you? Did you take it as disappointing or did you just love the game of baseball that much that you actually, you know, uh, didn't make the show as it's called? No, I was. It's it's a bitter disappointment, you know, to be to be successful at what you've chosen your profession, and then not get the opportunity to uh, to uh, get a shot in the big leagues. It was definitely disappointing, but uh, I still enjoyed the the ride, you know. And uh, I came 
I had two times uh, in 61 in San Diego. I had uh, got off to a good start, and and uh, we had uh, we were playing in uh, the the West Coast Swing. We went to uh, Portland and then to Seattle, Spokane, and uh, Vancouver, and. My my wife had flown back to Indiana because her dad had passed away, and so I flew from uh, Spokane back to uh, Indiana for the funeral, and then I flew back and joined the team in Salt Lake City. And then when we got back to San Diego the first day, we went to the ballpark, and the uh, general manager was in the clubhouse, and and when I came in, he says, come here, let's go outside, I want to talk to you. And he says, you're going to the big leagues tonight. The uh, I've been on the phone with the White Sox two or three times a day, and uh, he said, I know your wife is back in Indiana, and I want you to find a place to put your park your car because you're going to be flying out right away as soon as you get packed up. And uh, he says, I'm just waiting for the call. So, well, the, the call never came through. So the, uh, uh, that was how close I came that time. And then in 1960, I had been optioned out of uh, San Diego to uh, Mobile, Alabama, in the Cleveland organization on a land, land lease deal. And... Uh, well, they already had their starting rotation all set. So uh, when I got there, I was put in the bullpen, and you know I'd never pitched in a bullpen before. So uh, I had a good, I was having a, a great year down there in uh, uh, the uh, Hoot Evers was the Cleveland minor league farm director. And he, he came into Mobile uh, and, you know, checked on the ball club and talked to all the minor league players and the manager and wanted to see how things were going. And then he called me aside and he said, uh, uh, you know, we, we like what you've been doing here, coming into a, a strange organization, not knowing anyone. And he said... Uh, You've been doing a great job, and the manager uh, is impressed with you, and your teammates all are uh, proud to have you as a teammate. And he says, we're trying to buy your contract. And he says, it's not to pitch here in Mobile. It's to go to Cleveland. And uh, so he says, just... Be quiet about it, and he says, uh, we're hoping, we're working on it, we're hoping it comes to pass. Well, a few days later, the general manager called me in the office, and he showed me a telegram from the White Sox, and it said, no deal, we're hanging on to him. So, so that that was my, <laughs> guess, my David destiny again. And why they wanted to hang on to me, I don't know, because they had no plans for me, so. But that's the way it goes. It was disappointing. So, so what's it like? I mean, do you do you do you start thinking, you know, well, I I guess you know I've had a a good streak. I I decide what do I what do I want to do? I mean, how do you get into um, uh, the the White Sox organization without you know physically pitching for them? What and and what kind of decision process is that where you're like, you know, well, I'm not going to make the big leagues. Let me see what I can focus on and be uh, best at uh, uh, or renew myself. Well, the uh, I knew I was, uh, you know, beating my head against the wall. So I quit when I was 28 years old. And I, worked, I went to work in Herschel Lab in Valparaiso, Indiana as a machinist. And I worked there two years. And then one night I came home from work in the winter, and my wife said, you're supposed to call 
the ballpark, the White Sox called and they want to talk to you. So I called them and they, that was when Eddie Stanky was the manager and Marv Grissom was the pitching coach. And they wanted to change the routine of having the starting pitchers uh, 10 minutes of batting practice on their second day after they pitched. And they wanted to throw them, have them throw in the bullpen on the sides, you know, to, to work on things. And they wanted to know if I'd be interested in uh, throwing batting practice. So I, I uh, got a leave of absence at Herschel's for uh, six weeks. I figured, well, if it don't work out, i will go back to Herschel's. And so I went to spring training, and they liked what they saw, and, and uh, they offered me a contract. So that's how I got back into baseball. And then I threw batting practice for a few years, and uh, and then eventually worked into uh, uh, a coaching job and uh, and the traveling secretary job, and so that's how that all materialized. How supportive was your wife in all of this? When did you guys get married? Uh, do you have any children? I know I'm stepping ahead of myself again, but how supportive was family during you know your your baseball career and then going into doing what you eventually did for the White Sox for so long? Well, I played uh, three years of uh, pro ball before we got married, and uh, she... Uh, she, you know, she was my high school uh, sweetheart, and she knew all about baseball and basketball and all that, all that stuff. And uh, so, uh, no, she was she was my biggest fan. And, uh, she, uh, I could talk baseball with her, and she knew what ERAs were, and you know, and uh, all this kind of stuff. And she even charted my pitches. You know, at different times, kept track of my pitches, and and so she was she was all she was in it wholeheartedly. And uh, when uh, when I went back into baseball, I don't think that was would have been her choice. Uh, but uh, that was it. Seemed like that's what I had to do, and so. Uh, but once once I got going with the big league club, then uh, she got to travel with me off and on, and and uh, then uh, uh, we had we had one son, Scott, and uh, he was born when I was pitching in San Diego in '61. So uh, he was all involved, you know, when he he could go to the ballpark and do things around the clubhouse and all that so it uh it was it was uh, a good career and and happy but she put up with a lot by me being away so much you know because you're you're gone half the summer with the team traveling and uh, so uh, i i was pretty lucky to have someone that uh, stood by me like that while playing the game, did were you a historian of the game? Did you did you enjoy watching or, or about paying attention to what was happening in Major League Baseball while you were while you were playing? Did you did you save any of your uniforms? Did you or did you that even at that age did that even cross your mind uh, uh, as a youngster? I should save this or I wish I would have saved this or did you uh, collect any of uh, memorabilia of your playing career? Not when I was playing, but I did when I got to Chicago, you know, with the big club. Yeah. You know, in the minor leagues, you, could, you can't keep any of their equipment, uh, like uniforms and stuff like that. Now, I have a lot of uniforms when I was with the big club, and uh, I had a bunch of memorabilia, and the uh, one thing that I wished that I would have, you know, which... You never you, you never think of it while you're going through it. But I got to I went I got to go to the big league camp three years in a row. 
56, 57, and 58. And I got to pitch against Ted Williams in an exhibition game in wow. Sarasota. And uh, I, I, he grounded out to Nellie Fox. It, uh, you know how they played the shift sort of in sort of shallow right field. And, and Nellie picked up the ball, threw to me, covering first base for the out. And, uh, you know, to this day I wished I, I would have stuck that or thrown that ball out and made him keep it for me. Because uh, he was, he was, uh, Ted Williams was always my favorite player. I always thought he was probably the greatest hitter, you know, I'd ever lived. And so that was the only thing. But uh, as far as my memorabilia, I just, uh, you know, I had a lot of autographed balls by Hall of Famers and things like that. So, but nothing from when I played. You know, and continuing on that, you know, playing playing professional baseball, being a coach uh, uh, in professional baseball and, and doing what you did for so long for the White Sox, what what are some of the people, you know, besides you just talking about Ted Williams, what are some of the people you're like, you know, there is no way in heck I would have ever met some of the people that I've met if I didn't play the game of baseball? No, it was, uh, that's what I say. It was a true experience because, you know, being from the area that I was raised and then to, uh, to experience some of that stuff, you know, it's, uh, it's hard to believe that it really happened. You know, it, uh, uh, just like being a Cup fan all those years. And after my uh, second year in baseball, I'm in spring training, and uh, Johnny Schmitz was a, a big pitcher with the uh, uh, Cups that I, you know, really liked. And uh, Bill Serena, third baseman, and Randy Jackson. Here one day in, in spring training in uh, Hollywood, Florida, I'm pitching against the Buffalo team, and here's Johnny Schmitz, Bill Serena, Johnny, and uh, uh, Randy Jackson, you know, on the same field with me playing against them that I had idolized, you know, just three years before while I was a Cub fan, you know, listening to them on the radio. And uh, and then, you know, with guys like Louis Aparicio and Tommy John and Wilbur Wood and Gary Peters, Joe Harlan, all these, all these guys, and uh, and then even before that, you know, Nellie Fox and that whole crew, uh, you know, what an experience and great people, you know, a lot of fond memories with those guys. You know, be, besides probably being able to take Tommy John off the dribble and take him to the hole and score whenever you wanted to in basketball, um, t- 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 tell us a little bit about your little relationship with Tommy John. And, uh, you know, I, I got the uh, opportunity to uh, – uh, I was a, a little bit nervous, but I got the opportunity to interview Tommy John. And, uh, you know, he's a, an Indiana boy also. But uh, tell us a little bit about your uh, uh, relationship with Tommy John. Uh, he, uh, I roomed with him one year. My first year when I joined the White Sox in 68, I roomed with Joey Aparicio. And then I think it was the next year I roomed with uh, Tommy John. And I don't know if I roomed with him the whole year or what, but that was back when we had roommates. And well, we hit it off because I, I got to meet Tommy's uh, folks in spring training and, uh, and uh, knew them, you know, from Terre Haute, and uh, and uh, we we just uh, I don't know, we just hit it off. Uh, we got along with each other, and he got me, you know, he he uh, in New York, he knew uh, some people uh, from uh, Time Life magazine, and uh, we got he took me and. Uh, some of his teammates to Toots Shores restaurant and, and had dinner. And we went on to uh, a Broadway show, and uh, and then we went to uh, 
Radio City Music Hall one night and saw the the performance there and it was just things like that that I remember. I just I enjoyed I enjoyed his uh, friendship very much. He said Super that guy. he said to ask you the Mark McGuire story and his daughter. What's that? Uh, it, do you have a special story about a uh, incident with Mark McGuire? Well, the only <laughs> the only thing about Mark McGuire that I can remember is uh, I uh, I had to uh, get him a a plane ticket and uh, and I went in the uh, visiting clubhouse in Comiskey Park and and did something give him a a plane ticket or something. That's the only thing I can remember about that. You know? I don't remember that. Oh, that's okay. Now, now, you know, with all the years that you've spent in, you know, in baseball, and, you know, when it, you know, you've been retired now for a while, what, what, what leads to, you know what, uh, I've, I've had so much fun and the game has given me so much. It's, it's time to step away. And uh, what 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 do you do with your time? Uh, do you think about the ba- the game of baseball and what you've done, what you've done, did and done and did in the game? Uh, what's um, what's that like at that point in time where it's time to you know just you know move on and you know enjoy the the rest of your life? Well, when uh, the last twenty three years, I was traveling secretary. That uh, was a very stressful job at times, and uh, you, uh, when when you went on a road trip, you represented your organization. If the general manager wasn't along, you were the representative of the organization when you went into the, you know, the uh, the home team's uh, offices to do ticket work and and talk with the other general managers and the ticket people and the other traveling secretaries. And uh, so uh, over the years, dealing with player tickets and things like that, uh, when I, uh, the travel got to be pretty strenuous when the interleague, uh, we started the interleague schedule. Uh, I'll never forget, we... uh, we played a night game in Arlington, Texas, and uh, and uh, then uh, the next uh, you flew out of uh, Arlington, Texas, uh, you know, about one o'clock in the morning, and our next game was in New York, and you you landed and got to the hotel around five thirty in the morning, six o'clock, and uh, things like that. Just uh, and then going into new cities in the National League put a little more pressure on you as far as you know you're responsible for all the travel arrangements, hotels and airplanes and buses and equipment trucks. And when I retired after the '98 season, that next day I can't really describe the feeling. It just felt like. Uh, a thousand pounds were lifted off of my shoulders, and I was I was the happiest person in the world that day. I just couldn't I just couldn't feel believe the feeling that I felt of freedom. <laughs> so, I uh, that first summer that I was retired, you know, I'd I'd catch myself thinking after a night game and they're traveling. I'd say, well, they're just about getting to the airport now, getting ready to take off. And but that took a couple of years, and then I sort of that sort of started fading out of my mind. And uh, now I just enjoy watching them on TV, and uh, and uh, so I still pull for them just like I was working for them. So it, it's it, uh, it's been it's been. Uh, Quite an experience, and it, it took a couple of years to get it all out of my system. 
You know, I, I uh, Lanny Siegel was uh, instrumental in uh, getting this set up with you, and I appreciate Lanny and what he does, and um, um, I appreciate right. you giving me the time to interview. But um, I asked Lanny uh, this question, which, you know, he was a, a, a nutty, crazy White Sox fan for years, but uh, how happy or, you know, how full of pride or kind of satisfied were you when you actually – got to see the White Sox win the World Series when they beat uh, the Astros, and I think it was 2005. Oh, man, that was... I'll never forget that. After that final game of the World Series, and I jumped up, and uh, the wife and I hugged each other, and we... You know, it was, it was almost like we were... I was still working there, and... Uh, you know, that was, uh, I'd retired after the 98 season, so that was seven years after I retired, and the White Sox still thought enough of me that they uh, sent me a beautiful watch. You know, it's a trophy, a picture of the trophy on it, and uh, the Sox emblem on it, and, uh, and just a beautiful, beautiful watch. So at least I got something out of it. I'm never billion out of it. <laughs> okay, so here's my address. No, I'm just joking. Uh, <laughs> you know, the fraternity of baseball, What and you spend so many years in the game. Uh, I mean, do you stay in contact with some people via email? Do, do you stay in contact? Do, does your phone ring occasionally from uh, people that you were a part of the game with? Or is it, uh, you know, um, is it just a, a retirement where you get to, you know, you know, do what you want to do and, and, and you're enjoying life? Well, I, I'm, uh, like I said, been retired that long, so I'm, I'm privileged to have got to enjoy that many years of retirement, but I stay, I talk with Gary Peters quite often. In fact, I talked with him last night and I talked with Wilbur Wood uh, last week and uh, I, uh, I talked with the traveling secretary who took my job with the White Sox and I still know many of the front office people and, uh, of course, Tony LaRusso, I work over here, and uh, I don't know any of the players anymore because they're, they've all recycled. And, uh, but, uh, yeah, I, uh, I, I have a teammate that I played with from Saco, Maine, Dick Grant. I check in on him with every now and then and still friends with his kids, so it's I still take, I still stay connected, and I'm still interested in it, in the whole deal. You know, I ask this question of everybody, and you know, everybody gives me the same answer. But I will look out the window at, uh, and occasionally think of, you know, maybe a different corner that I would have turned or a different choice that I would have made in life. Um, if, if you could go back, uh, is there anything that you would change or, uh, anything that you feel like, uh, um, uh, anything that you would change in the, the game of baseball that you've been associated with? No, I just, uh, you know, everything, everything has a purpose, I guess. And, uh, the way you, the way things work out. And I was just very fortunate to the, that the men upstairs took care of me and put a couple people in place that got me into the profession, you know, professional baseball. And uh, so I'm just thankful for that. And, uh, you know, you, you can't, uh, I would, I would give anything to say that I got to play in the big leagues just at least for one day. And, uh, I, that's the only regret I have is that I didn't get an opportunity to, to see if I was good enough, because you never know. You know, maybe I wasn't good enough. Maybe I was good enough. You don't know until you get the opportunity. So uh, now there's uh, uh, no 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 real regrets. I just uh, am happy the way it turned out, and uh, it, it was a good uh, it was a good life. I could finish the interview with "I Did It My Way" by Frank Sinatra, huh? 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, he, I, just, I just, uh, just, I, I enjoyed it all. I'll tell you that. Glenn Rosenbaum, uh, you know, four decades as a member of the Chicago White Sox organization, you know, originally from Union Mills, Indiana. It was a pleasure to speak to you. Time gets away. I'm sorry for uh, keeping you a little bit long. Uh, I, I, I needed to keep it short with Tommy John because I didn't know what kind of tangents he was going to go on. But you told some great stories and everybody's going to really enjoy this. Okay, well, I enjoyed it. Thank you for having me on. <laughs>